Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to Cleveland Clinic's webinar regarding vasectomy and vasectomy reversal. My name is Aaron Smith. I'm the um, clinical fellow of microsurgery, male infertility, men's health here at um, Cleveland Clinic. And it's my pleasure to be moderating the session tonight. I am joined today by two experts in the field, Dr. Scott Lundy and Dr. Rave T. Bole. Dr. Scott Lundy specializes in vasectomy, vasectomy reversal, and male infertility and men's health at Cleveland Clinic. Um, you can see here, he practices at multiple locations in the Cleveland Clinic system. Dr. Rave T. Bole also specializes in vasectomy, vasectomy reversal, and infertility and men's health. And you can see she also um, practices at multiple Cleveland Clinic um, facilities. So to start us off, Dr. Bole is going to be talking about vasectomies. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. All right, so let's get started with some basic questions about vasectomy and why this procedure is done and why it makes sense. So we'll start with what actually makes up seminal fluid or semen? So about the majority of seminal vesicle fluid, about 65%, uh, comes from uh, structures called the seminal vesicles. That's gonna be the majority of what you see in ejaculate. About 25% of that fluid that you see actually comes from the prostate. Uh, and only about 10% of that uh, is gonna be sperm. Now these three substances, the fluid from the seminal vesicles, the fluid from the prostate, and then the fluid that's carrying the sperm, all three go into the urethra to make semen and the final ejaculate that you see um, after climax. Specifically for the sperm, and this is where we get into why vasectomy is a procedure that's done, the sperm get made inside the testicle and then they travel from within the testicle to the epididymis, and that's where they mature. And, that, and if you can look, see the screen here, these are the little cream colored structures uh, on the screen that are sitting on top of the testicle. From there, the sperm journey through the vas deferens, uh, and then finally out into the urethra. Now that's important, and it's important to know that the vas deferens is a passageway for sperm, and that's gonna be why we focus on the vas deferens as a site for vasectomy. Next slide. So a vasectomy, as you all probably know, is a procedure for permanent male contraception. Uh, so it's permanent male birth control. Uh, the purpose of the vasectomy is to block the right and the left vas deferens that we just discussed. So those are the tubes that carry the sperm. And on our diagram here on the screen, you can see a, a little animation or a little a diagram of the vas deferens that's been cut off at certain points to stop sperm from traveling. Next slide. You might be curious, how often are vasectomies performed? Is this a common procedure? So about 500,000 vasectomies are performed per year in the United States. Uh, and we actually performed a study at the Cleveland Clinic last year showing that the numbers of men getting vasectomies are actually increasing in recent years, especially among men under 30 and men without children. So that's something that's been happening more so recently. You might also ask, well, what are some other options for male contraception? Are there any other options that you can use to, to prevent um, fertilizing an egg? Um, and so we have some other options listed here, and I'm sure you're familiar with some, if not all of them. One option that's popular is condoms. Uh, condoms can also come with spermicide on them for extra protection. Some people use a withdrawal technique that has not been found to be as effective, but that is what some people do. Uh, and then there are some exciting new treatments on the horizon for male contraception that are not yet FDA approved, uh, but that could potentially be the future of male contraception. And those are things like pills and gels uh, that again are not yet FDA approved. On the other hand, options for female birth control uh, to try and prevent pregnancy, those are gonna be things like hormonal pills, uh, spermicide inserts, diaphragms, intrauterine devices, and then a more invasive type of procedure uh, called the tubal ligation surgery. Next slide. So these next few sets of pictures are gonna go through just briefly the steps of a vasectomy procedure. This first image is showing the surgeon feeling for the vas deferens and isolating it where it's easy to see at the skin level. And you can see this bulge here where that's being shown. Next picture. This picture is demonstrating 
uh, local anesthetic numbing medication that's always uh, placed for the patient to be comfortable. Now, we'll talk about this in a uh, next slide, but um, essentially you can have this procedure done while you're awake, in which case, once this local goes in, you're not really feeling much of anything that's sharp or pokey. So this is for your comfort. And some people also elect to have the vasectomy done with sedation. So they're gonna be um, not aware of any of this happening. Next picture. This next step of the procedure is making a very small opening uh, in the skin to be able to access the vas deferens tube. Uh, here at the Cleveland Clinic, we use the typically use the no scalpel technique. So we're using an instrument that's not a scalpel to make a very small opening. And we'll talk about that further on next slides. Next picture, please. In this picture, we're showing that the vas deferens is being isolated and brought up to the skin through that very small opening uh, so that the surgeon can then work on it. Next picture. This is a close up view of the tissue sheet that surrounds the vas deferens. Again, using very small instruments, this tissue sheet is isolated and pulled off of the vas deferens so that you can see the vas deferens uh, nice and clean and, and uh, ready for the next steps of the procedure. Next picture. In this picture, we're seeing uh, the surgeon go ahead and cut out a portion of the vas deferens after clamping it on both sides. This is gonna be one of the techniques, one of multiple that we use to ensure that sperm cannot pass through this tube after the procedure is done. Next picture. This one is showing how the surgeon will use a method either using suture here or clips to tie off and clamp that vas deferens so that nothing can pass through. Next picture. And then finally, closing up that small opening that was made on the skin. Uh, typically, we use very small dissolvable stitches just to make sure that the skin is nice and dry uh, and that you're able to go home in comfort uh, with minimal oozing or bruising afterwards. Next slide, please. So just like the pictures we, we saw, uh, there are multiple different ways that your surgeon will go ahead and block the vas deferens tube from passing any more sperm after your procedure. Uh, one method is to remove a small part of the vas deferens, and that's what you can see in this first picture here where a small part of the vas deferens has been removed. Uh, it's also very effective to use cautery, so that's heat. Uh, to go ahead and close up the opening of the vas deferens tube so that no sperm can pass through. Often we use either clips or suture then to tie off, physically close uh, the opening of the vas deferens tube as well. And then in this final picture uh, on the right, uh, we're showing a picture of actually placing a little bit of tissue in between the two ends of the vas deferens. That's called fascial interposition. And along with the other techniques, uh, multiple of which are used during your procedure, this is a very, very effective way of blocking that vas deferens tube to make sure that no sperm can pass through afterwards. Next slide. All right, so now that we've gone through the reason that we do a vas uh, vasectomy and what is a vas deferens and how the procedure is done, what do you need to know from a logistics standpoint before you have one? So, like we said, this is a minimally invasive procedure, and we typically use the no scalpel technique uh, with a very small instrument to make a very small opening uh, so that your recovery time is much shorter afterwards. The procedure itself is quite short. It's about 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, uh, but really not overly, um, overly long, and that's designed specifically so that you'd be comfortable during the procedure. There are multiple different locations that you can have this done. Very commonly, patients will have this done in the office with the numbing medication that we showed in the picture before, and sometimes also relaxing medication that you can take as a pill uh, before your procedure, just if you're feeling a little anxious about having this done. Uh, alternatively, you can also have the procedure done with sedation in an outpatient surgery center, and that would be if you want to not be awake during the procedure, um, that's a good option uh, as well. And typically, after a vasectomy, you can actually drive yourself home. Uh, patients are typically feeling just fine to do that. Uh, and the only caveat would be if you just had sedation or you took one of the pill forms of relaxing medication, that's the only situation in which we would ask you to bring yourself a driver to drive you home instead. Now, on to what we can expect after vasectomy. So there are some things that are normal, and we'll go over those things on this slide. And then there are some things that we wouldn't expect 
that we would certainly want to know about, and we'll go over those on the next slide. So normally, uh, we would expect a little bit of bruising, a little bit of swelling, uh, maybe some mild soreness at the, at the area that you had the procedure done. And it's also common to feel a small lump at the vasectomy side. If you were to feel inside the scrotum afterwards, you might feel a small lump in there. And we can go over that in a little bit as to why that is. Um, so those are typical things that we would counsel you to expect after a vasectomy. After the procedure though, we definitely want you to rest and relax at home. Typically, most of our patients are taking extra strength Tylenol and Advil uh, and typically not needing anything stronger than that to remain comfortable at home. So that gives you an idea of the typical comfort that most people have after a procedure like this. Uh, we always recommend using an ice pack on the scrotum for extra comfort as well. And we just tell you not to place this directly on the skin uh, to avoid damaging the skin, but overclose. This is a very effective method for numbing and helping with that initial mild soreness. Wearing supportive underwear is also a good idea. Uh, so anything with just a little bit of lift and support for the scrotum to help keep that swelling down. Uh, typically just not boxers, but boxer briefs or athletic underwear are very appropriate. In terms of activities that you can do after a vasectomy, uh, we typically caution you to avoid lifting anything heavier than 10 pounds for about one week uh, or from doing any sort of heavy exercise for about one week. And that's going to give you the best chance of not having any annoying swelling or bruising after this procedure. And then in terms of sexual activity, we also recommend avoiding ejaculation for one week after the procedure. And this is gonna help reduce the incidence of that little lump that you can sometimes feel uh, deep in the scrotum if you were to feel it at the vasectomy site. Next slide. All right, so this slide is about the rare uh, possibility that you have a complication after vasectomy. This is typically a very uh, minimally invasive procedure and most people do exceedingly well. Uh, but certainly there are things that we want you to watch for when you get home so that you can let us know if you're experiencing any of these unusual things. Uh, so a little bit of bruising and swelling is normal, but if you're having swelling that's beyond the size of a baseball, that's pretty rare. That's only about 2% of patients, but we would want to know about that, certainly. Uh, it's possible to have a small risk of skin infection. Uh, we typically don't send you home with antibiotics because 98% of men don't have the, any kind of infection happen to them. But certainly if you're noticing redness or swelling or you feel like you're having drainage from the site, we want you to let us know so that we can see if you need some antibiotics for that. The next thing I want to talk about is pain. It's certainly common to have a little bit of mild bruising, swelling, and discomfort right after the vasectomy, but we certainly expect that to go away after you have the procedure. And so uh, long-lasting pain after a vasectomy is not common. That would be about 1% of men. Uh, and this is a condition you may have heard of called post-vasectomy pain syndrome. Not common at all, not in 99% of men, but again, if that's happening to you, we want to know about it so that we can talk about options for what to do next. The next uh, set of things that would be unexpected would be failure. So what if the procedure doesn't work? So early failure would be when we recognize that the procedure hasn't worked early on when we do your first post vasectomy semen check. And we'll talk about that and when that usually happens. Uh, but there's about a 1% rate that at that check, we realize, no, there's still sperm uh, in, in this uh, semen analysis. And that's why it's so important to do a check just so that we know if that has happened. So it's very uncommon, especially because we do so many different techniques to keep those two ends of the vas deferens away from each other. Uh, but that's so that's a pretty uncommon thing to happen. But that's something that we also want to recognize early on if it does happen. And then the second possibility is even if the procedure was successful at first, there is a phenomenon known as late failure. That's really rare. That's something like one in 2,500 patients. Uh, and we think that that happens due to a phenomenon known as recanalization, where even though there were multiple techniques done to keep the two ends of your vas deferens apart, it's possible for your body to try and heal those two ends back together. So you can imagine that's pretty uncommon. Um, because it's so uncommon, we actually uh, don't anticipate that typically, and the only time we really expect you to have to check to make sure the procedure worked is at that three months. But certainly, if you're worried about it, you can always message your urologist and, and check again later on if you feel the need to do that. But it's very uncommon for that to happen. 
Now, I do want to take a pause here and mention some conditions that we know based on scientific data that we've collected over many, many patients. We know these things do not happen because of a vasectomy. So we know that prostate cancer is not caused by vasectomies. Uh, you are not at a higher risk of a heart attack or stroke because you had a vasectomy. Vasectomies do not cause dementia. They do not cause problems with blood pressure and they do not cause problems with urination. So if you've ever heard any of these things, uh, it's important to get the information uh, from your urologist, uh, but we can certainly go ahead and feel confident based on the scientific data that we have that those, those uh, conditions are, are not to be, and not something that we would expect after a vasectomy, and we have not seen evidence to suggest that they are. So this slide we wanted to go over because many men are wondering, well, what will sex be like after a vasectomy? Um, you're, you're doing a procedure on your uh, organs in that general region. You know, what can I expect after having a vasectomy? So let's go over these important points to know. So first of all, you will still see a normal amount of semen when you ejaculate. And thinking back to one of our first slides, that's because the sperm portion of the semen is going to be less than 10%. So the majority of what you see in the ejaculate is still going to come out. Uh, and that is something that is pretty reassuring to most people uh, once they realize that that part of the sexual experience is not something that we expect to change after a vasectomy. Second thing that I want to highlight, you'll still have normal erections afterwards. So Again, that procedure that you saw in pictures that I went over is very specific on the vas deferens portion of the anatomy, and it doesn't affect the processes or the organs that control erections. So we expect you to still have normal sexual function. Your sex drive after a vasectomy and arousal should also be unchanged, uh, and you should still be able to experience a very normal orgasm. Uh, and then finally, your testicles are still expected to make a normal amount of testosterone. Again, because of how specific and how minimally invasive this procedure is, we don't expect there to be a bad effect on your testicles, and they should still be able to make an appropriate amount of hormones just like they were making before. Interestingly, your testicles will still also make sperm. It's just that it won't travel out, uh, and your body will be able to get rid of those sperm uh, and not let them pass the vas deferens where the procedure was done. So, after all this, you might ask, well, are there any risks to sex after a vasectomy? Is there anything that I have to think about after having this procedure done? So, there's just two things that we want you to remember. The first thing is that vasectomy doesn't work immediately. It takes about three months to clear the last remaining sperm from your system because there are still going to be some stragglers in there, and we want to make sure that they're out uh, even past the point that the vas deferens was treated. So we want you to use some other form of birth control until you get your post vasectomy confirmation test, and that's typically at about three months. After your confirmation test comes back all clear, then you're not necessarily required to check a semen test again because of how rare it would be for the procedure um, to fail at a later date, uh, but you certainly can if, if, if you feel worried about it, but you're certainly not required to after that initial test. The second thing that we want you to remember after vasectomy is that you can still get sexually transmitted infections. Vasectomies are only to prevent unwanted pregnancy. So if you're potentially at risk for getting sexually transmitted infections, uh, only a condom would prevent this. So that's important to know as well. A little more detail here about the post vasectomy semen test. Here at our practice, uh, we have you call the andrology lab for an appointment three months after your procedure. Uh, so typically that will mean that you provide a specimen at home and then bring it to our lab within one hour, or you can alternatively just come in and provide the specimen on site. Once you provide that specimen, the lab will analyze it and your surgeon will always, always contact you to let you know that your procedure was a success. So until you get that notification, continue to use another form of birth control. And once you get that result back, it's gonna show either that there were no sperm or a very, very small number of non-moving sperm. That's considered a success. And at that point, you'll get a notification from your surgeon that you can stop using alternate forms of birth control. All right. Thanks, Dr. Bolin. That was very informative. Um, just want to remind everybody that, you know, as our physicians are talking, feel free to, if you think of any questions, type them up in the chat, and we'll answer all these questions at the end. Um, next, we're going to talk about what happens if you want to have your vasectomy reversed. 
and that's going to be a talk by Dr. Lundy. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for that uh, outstanding talk, Dr. Bole, and thanks for that kind introduction, Dr. Smith. Um, today, I'll be talking about what happens if you change your mind after a vasectomy. Now, of course, we always tell patients that this is designed to be a permanent solution, and it is, but we also recognize that sometimes life changes and circumstances change. And for those men, a vasectomy reversal or other fertility restoration may be the right choice. We know that about 6% of patients who undergo a vasectomy each year will ultimately explore options for fertility restoration or reversal. And that typically occurs because they either have a new partner or their existing partner and the patient desire more children. Or in rare cases, the pain that develops after a vasectomy that never goes away can also be treated using a vasectomy reversal or other techniques. Next slide. So there are a number of options after a vasectomy that will allow you to accomplish your goals of either restoring fertility or treating pain. In the case of fertility, uh, the main options are listed here. And the two that we spend the most amount of time with during a visit to discuss this issue are a vasectomy reversal and a sperm retrieval and assisted reproduction. So the first is a vasectomy reversal. This is a procedure that we'll talk about momentarily, but essentially we reverse the blockage that we've occurred by unblocking the vas deferens in a number of different ways. The benefits of this approach are that patients can then conceive naturally and conceive multiple times uh, in the old fashioned way without having in many cases to use assisted reproduction. And there's minimal risk to the partner as well, because this is a surgical intervention on uh, the vas deferens, which is a, a small isolated part of the body, and there's no need for an egg retrieval or other assisted reproduction. On the other hand, some men would prefer to avoid a procedure such as this after their vasectomy. And in this case, we do offer the ability to remove sperm directly from the testicle, keeping in mind, as Dr. Bole said, that the testicle makes sperm for the rest of your life and will always have some sperm present in the absence of other problems. And so in this case, we can go in and remove that sperm, but it's important to know that when we do this, that sperm is only sufficient in quantity for assisted reproduction, and in particular, in most cases, in vitro fertilization or IVF. And IVF, as most of you know, uh, is also called test tube baby. It's where the egg and sperm are put together in a dish and allowed to form an embryo, and then that embryo is transferred back into the female partner uh, to cause a pregnancy. Other options like the use of donor sperm or adoption are also available if those are appropriate for your situation. Next slide. So a vasectomy reversal is a fairly technically challenging procedure, but it's a procedure that we perform commonly at the Cleveland Clinic uh, with our fertility fellowship trained surgeons. And there are two forms that this can take depending on the anatomy and what we find during the operation. So it's first important to note that we can't predict necessarily which of these options will be appropriate for you. We can guess based on a number of parameters, but we can't know for sure until we start the surgery. So essentially we make a small window into the scrotum. And in many cases we can do this surgery through the incision the same size as the original vasectomy. And we isolate the vas deferens and find both sides above and below the blockage that had been previously formed. And we then ensure that those tubes are open above and below. And then we use very small sutures that are far smaller than a human hair and an operating microscope to put these sutures around the vas deferens. And for scale purposes, this vas deferens is um, smaller than the wire that connects your mouse to your computer. So it's quite small. And that's why we have to use an operating microscope to do this. These are very successful and they're most commonly used if your vasectomy was within 10 years or sometimes even longer, but under 10 years, this is by far the most common option. In some cases, however, the vas deferens has the blockage that was placed there during your vasectomy, but a second blockage has formed in the ensuing years because of the pressure that's been put on the other structures. This typically happens at the beginning part of the vas deferens or in the epididymis. And when this occurs, we have to go back to our anatomy drawing earlier to see that the testicle is connected to the epididymis before it goes into the vas deferens. And we then have to connect this vas deferens directly to the epididymis in a procedure we call a vasoepididymostomy, or for short, a VE. This is more difficult and does take more time, 
Uh, and the sutures for this are even smaller than the ones we use for a vasovasostomy or a VV. We make this decision in the operating room, and if it's necessary, at our institution, we'll perform whatever surgery is appropriate for you. It is important to note that if we have to use this option, however, the success rates are slightly lower. Next slide. So what are the success rates? And uh, what you can see here are the success rates for patency in yellow, patency meaning the return of sperm in the ejaculate. And on the x-axis, you can see that this is related in time to how long the vas deferens has been obstructed. So if, if a man has a vasectomy and then a year later would like a reversal, the success rates for this are 95 to 98%. They're very good. On the other hand, if it's been 15 years since the vasectomy, the patency or technical success rates are a little lower and they can be in the mid 80% range. We then have to compare that to the success rates uh, as measured by pregnancy, which of course then requires the female partner to be worked up and uh, we have to understand her status and any female issues as well. So this is always lower than the patency rate, but in this case, you can see that for an early vasectomy that's less than five years, the pregnancy rate is still very good. It's two out of every three patients. And then it falls slightly down to about the 50% range if uh, the obstructive period has been longer than 15 years. And this is also partially due to the fact that as couples try to conceive after having had a vasectomy 15 years later, the female partner is often a little bit older and sometimes that can decrease fertility on the female side as well. What you can see here is that the rate of VE, in other words, the percentage of time that we need to do that more complicated repair we talked about, goes up as time goes on. This is not the success rate for this, but this is simply the percentage of cases we have to do the more complex repair on. And as time goes on, this number goes up. Next slide. So what should you expect after your reversal? Most men do quite well after this procedure and their recovery is very similar to the vasectomy in the first place. We do ask that you have a driver to take you home and that's because typically the reversals are done under general anesthesia, which means you're not safe to drive afterwards. Most of the time the swelling and bruising is very mild and similar to the vasectomy as we said, and Tylenol and Advil are enough to provide pain relief. We do recommend the ice pack, just like with a vasectomy, to help with swelling and comfort. And then we ask that men not ejaculate for two weeks after this procedure to let everything heal. We also strongly recommend scrotal support with either a jock strap or compression shorts, because by fixing this defect, we oftentimes will have to move the testicle up slightly to allow for the repair to occur. And we wanna make sure that that testicle and that repair is not under tension during the healing process. We also ask that men not do any heavy lifting or vigorous activity for two weeks for the same purpose. And that time off from work really does vary according to what your job uh, entails. And we customize your recovery plan based upon what you do for a living and how much time you're able to successfully uh, achieve. There is a question in the chat about how long men take off from work if they have a career that keeps them on their feet. And I'll answer that both for vasectomy and reversal, um, given the the nice tie in here. Um, we typically tell you to take a couple days off of any um, job that is not a desk job. Uh, and then up to a week is ideal, but some men have to go back after two to three days. And as long as they're wearing compression shorts or a jock strap, we do tell you that you'll swell a little bit, but most men do fine with that. Um, I would say that the restrictions for a reversal are a little bit more stringent because the consequences of an injury are greater. And so we really do ask that you avoid any vigorous activity for at least one and preferably two weeks. And that might, in, might require you to take a little bit of extra time off from work. Next slide. So complications can happen with this and any surgeries. Thankfully, this is a relatively safe surgery that's in a relatively safe part of the body. Bruising and swelling is expected, just like with a vasectomy. I tell men up to the size of a baseball is fine, even black and blue. There is a small risk of an infection, that's 2 to 3%. And uh, this is ideally minimized by giving antibiotics during the surgery, but not after. There is a possibility of a failure too, and that failure rate is low, but does exist. Those failures can either be early or late. And early means that the procedure was technically unsuccessful from the get-go. Late failures are typically a situation where 
The repair was successful and sperm are seen in the ejaculate, but during the healing process, the body scars down the repair and makes the lumen or the inside of the vas too narrow to allow sufficient sperm to pass. If this happens, we can treat this with medications and sometimes avoid further surgery. In other cases, we have to turn to other options or redo the surgery. Some couples opt for cryopreservation of their sperm during the initial reversal. This is a nice option for couples who don't want to have any other surgeries and are willing to consider IVF as a backup strategy. And when we do this, we simply take the fluid that comes out of the vas deferens and freeze it. And that frozen sperm can last for decades in the freezer for future use with IVF if necessary. And there is a small cost to this with an annual fee, but it's much less than the cost of the reversal itself. Next slide. So typically at six weeks after the reversal surgery is done, we'll perform the first semen test to assess whether the procedure was successful or not. And this does vary from surgeon to surgeon slightly, but about six weeks is the first check for most men. At that point, we'll get a good sense of whether there are sperm in the ejaculate and how many and whether they're swimming. And if the counts are low or zero, it could be that we simply check too early and that the body is still healing. So we may recommend further anti-inflammatory medications or steroids to help with that process or simply time. And it's important to note that a vasoepididymostomy or that complex VE repair can take much longer, even up to a year before we see sperm in the ejaculate. And it's not a cause for concern. Once we see swimming sperm, or even before in some cases, we recommend that you start trying to conceive as long as it's within uh, after two weeks from the initial surgery. And uh, sometimes couples even come back to their post-op visit pregnant, which is always really exciting for us. Next slide. So sex after a reversal is very much like sex before a reversal or after a, uh, or after a vasectomy. So this sex typically will not change much and the amount of jac ejaculate will also not change. Although you might have a slightly larger ejaculate volume because of that 10% that Dr. Bolle discussed. Uh, for the men who have pain after vasectomy, and this is the reason we did the reversal, this is typically improved. And we quote about an 80% success rate with pain improvement from a vasectomy after we've completed the reversal. Some men note that their testicles sit a little higher in the scrotum after the reversal, and that's because we've performed that repair and had to sometimes move the testicle up in the scrotum, but this typically resolves with time. And it's important to note that there is, again, no change on erections, hormones like testosterone or orgasm after this procedure. Next slide. So those are the main key points we wanted to talk about tonight. I think it's important to relay that a vasectomy is a very good option for most men and is safe and reliable. And it's important to note that if your situation and circumstances change, there are still options that will allow you to conceive and have further children. So I'd like to thank Dr. Bolle, uh, uh, and we'll now take any questions. And I think Dr. Smith will help us uh, with that. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Lundy. Great presentation. Let's see. Okay, so we have a lot of questions. Thank you to everyone who asked questions. So how long do most men take off from work? They have a career that keeps them on their feet. Dr. Um, Bole, you talked about this. Why don't you uh, give a little reminder about that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, for all of these procedures, we want to focus on you as an individual. We know that everyone has different job duties. We know that everyone's pain tolerance is different. We know that individual bodies heal differently. So if you have a desk job, it's going to be very different than someone who is on their field all the time or certainly someone who's lifting heavy things at work. Um, if you can take the time off of work and you do have a career where you're constantly on your feet, it probably is a good idea to take anywhere from three or four days off, potentially all the way up to a week off. 
but as Dr. Lundy said before, that's not really possible for everyone. Uh, so if you have to go back to work in a certain amount of time, uh, potential strategies that you could do is try to pick a vasectomy day that's closer to the end of the week. Then you maybe have the weekend to take off in addition uh, and then wearing something supportive uh, for the scrotum, like a jock strap or something compressive uh, is really going to help limit any swelling that you might experience. Great question. I think you're muted, Dr. Smith. Oh, sorry. One more question. Um, is there ever any nerve damage um, that one should be worried about when performing a vasectomy, uh, Dr. Lundy? Typically, no. The nerves that run in this part of the body are microscopically small, so we can't see them even if we wanted to. There are nerves that run around and in the wall of the vas deferens and that we can encounter and can uh, will be forced to divide or control during the vasectomy procedure. We think that this may be related to the source of pain, and so there are advancements in how the procedure is done to try and avoid this pain. On the other hand, much of the pain that we see, we think, is related simply to the blockage of the vas deferens itself and that backup that the testicle feels because the sperm has nowhere to go, which is not exactly nerve related, but more congestion, if you will. And so we don't worry so much about nerve damage. We worry about pain. And if a man comes back with pain, luckily we have a number of good treatment options that we can discuss. And those range from giving it time and many men will resolve their pain with time to medications or even procedures and surgeries with a high chance of success. And those are in addition to the reversal. There are other options as well. Um, but as far as, you know, large nerve fibers that we see or nerves with a name on them in an anatomy book, that's not uh, what we see in this part of the body. Great, thank you. So another question, often in advertisements online, Instagram, what have you, you have, you see a lot of people advertising, they do vasectomy reversals, come to them for vasectomy reversal. What should patients be looking for when they choose who they want to see or, you know, who's a good person to do this procedure? Dr. Bola, you want to take this one? Sure, I might tag team this with Dr. Alendi uh, because uh, we actually published on this um, last year. So that's, that's an excellent and very perceptive question uh, that we've looked at as a center that specializes in this type of a procedure. Um, you know, certainly it's it's difficult uh, for people online to figure out what they should figure out. I think that what I'll start with is is transparency. Whoever you go to for this procedure should be very transparent with you, uh, being able to tell you what their success rates are, how they do the procedure. Uh, the two types of connection that Dr. Lundy talked about are very important. Uh, it's a difficult procedure to do to reverse a vasectomy with very, very uh, small sutures and microscopic instruments, and your surgeon should be prepared to do either one, whichever one is the best for you uh, in that surgery. So uh, wh whoever you're talking to about doing this procedure uh, should be equally comfortable with doing either the simple or the complex connection and should be able to tell you about that. Dr. Lundy, any other insights from the research that we've done on this topic? Yeah, I think you'll notice a number of different opinions about this topic. Uh, you'll find providers who perform this procedure who are urologists without specialty training. You'll find fellowship or specialty trained microsurgeons who do it. You'll find providers from other specialties even, and, and that might include general surgeons or orthopedic surgeons or family doctors. And I think the most important questions to ask are related to how often this procedure is done and what the success rates are, not nationwide, but by the provider who could be doing your surgery. I also think it's important to note that the cost of this is often out of pocket and not covered by insurance. And some providers are more expensive than others. And while cost is not everything, uh, there is uh, the old adage that you get what you, you pay for. And some providers will do this for much less than others, but may not even use sutures, for example, might use glue to put things back together, a particular kind of biologic glue. And we know that those outcomes aren't quite as good. And so I think it's important to find a surgeon that you trust and uh, are able to get along with and can ask questions to, and you'll receive good question, good answers and good information in return, and to have an honest dialogue about this. 
And I always encourage patients to seek second opinions and to identify which surgeon is right for them because all of us do things slightly differently and our goal should be just to make you comfortable and to ensure that you have the best chance of success with your procedure. Great, thank you. What should what should a, a patient do on the day of their vasectomy before having the vasectomy done? Anything in particular they need to be doing or anything they need, need to be worried about? Dr. Lundy? I think the first thing to know is that most men find this procedure to be far less dramatic than they were expecting. And they breeze through this procedure, they're, they're comfortable. Uh, I have a, a laundry list of horrible urology dad jokes that I use during vasectomies and uh, my colleagues know some of them, but uh, we tend to just have a really relaxed and um, uh, uh, carefree discussion during the vasectomy for most men. So don't stress too much about what the needles are gonna feel like or the tugging. We'll get you through this. That's our job is to make you comfortable. Um, I do tell people that if they wanna take an ibuprofen before the procedure, I'm okay with that. Some providers would prefer to wait till afterwards, but I'd rather you be comfortable. Uh, some patients require Valium or nitrous or laughing gas or other things to help. Those do help, but they don't take away the sensation entirely. And so most men ultimately will choose either a procedure under local anesthesia or in the operating room, but we do what's right for you. And we discuss that uh, hopefully before the day of, but we can still change our plans on the day of if, if needed. I think it's important to uh, have the area clean and tidy and potentially even shaved if possible. That tends to make things a little bit easier. Um, I would not recommend having the area waxed on the day of, which occasionally happens. Uh, that tends to be uncomfortable for people. But um, go into this procedure with uh, with an open mind, and um, and I think most men do fine. Great. Um, another question. So a lot of guys, a lot of patients get these this lump above their testicle. What what is that, Doctor Bolle? Yeah, that's a great question uh, and, and a pretty common question. If you're just feeling down there afterwards and you feel something that feels like a little lump that wasn't there before, you know, what could that be? Uh, so certainly it's possible that it's a little bit of scar tissue as your body's healing uh, or, or a little bit of inflammation. If you're feeling down there right after the surgery, um, you might be feeling some of that. And if that's what it is, we expect that to get a little softer and less noticeable with time. You may always notice a little bit of a lump um, in the area if you're really feeling uh, for it. But uh, in many situations, it gets less um, less easy to feel with time. Uh, in some situations, it's what called it's what's called a sperm granuloma, and that's essentially, uh, if you think about it, it, it is almost a little piece of a little bit of sperm that leaks out of one of the ends, and your body sort of walls it off. Uh, and puts a little bit extra tissue surrounding that that uh, small amount of sperm that leaked out. Um, and that's not doesn't cause you to have pain and doesn't make you sick, uh, but it can certainly feel like a lump if you feel down there. So that's a possibility as well. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that we recommend not ejaculating for a week after you have the vasectomy procedure is to avoid some of that fluid leaking out and try and hopefully reduce the risk that you have uh, sort of that lump that you feel uh, sometimes down there if it's from a sperm granuloma. But again, it's not bad for your health. Uh, it just may be something you notice that's different after a procedure. Great. Well, thank you both so much. Um, that's it for our questions. Um, so once again, thank you, Dr. Lundy. Thank you, Dr. Bole. Fantastic talks, very informative. Um, thank you to our team that set up this webinar. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us tonight to listen. And for those um, who are gonna listen to this re recorded webinar in the future. Um, and if you have any more questions, if you wanna talk some more to either of, you know, Dr. Lundy, Dr. Bole, anybody from our team, feel free you know, to come into the office, make an appointment, and we're happy to talk and guide you through this process. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a good night.